it, it makes me feel very proud to, to be, you know, 100% Polish American as well as, uh, you know, proud of my grandfather and proud of Poland and, and, and proud of uh, General Haller for his, his, his leadership and what he did. The Polish army in France, known as the Blue Army from the color of its uniforms, or the Haller Army from the name of its commander, was the most prominent Polish armed formation in exile during World War I. The Blue Army was established in 1917, established by decree of the French president on the initiative of the Polish National Committee. A significant force was created by Polish volunteers from all over the world. Emigrants from Polish lands, Poles from the German and Austro-Hungarian armies who either deserted or were taken prisoner by the Allies, and above all, representatives of the French and American Polonia. From October 1917 to mid-February 1919, over 38,000 volunteers were registered in the United States. About 22,000 volunteers were qualified for military service. After being sworn in, they were sent to the Kosciuszko training camp in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Canada. Many already had basic military training acquired in the combat teams of the Polish Falcons Alliance in America, which was initially a sports gymnastics organization that eventually assumed a paramilitary character. It was later on in, in life where I actually learned about all the, the over 10,000 people from southeastern Michigan, from the Detroit area, who actually went to Poland by way of Canada to serve Poland um, during, during the war time. By the Treaty of September 28, 1918, the Blue Army was recognized by the Entente powers as an independent, allied, and sole co-belligerent Polish army. The Paris-based Polish National Committee, identified by Western powers as the organ exercising political control over the Polish army, gained the right to appoint the Supreme Commander of the Polish Army. General Józef Haller was appointed to this position. World War I ended in November 1918, but not for Poland, which was still fighting for independence. The issue of access to the sea was at stake, and the Greater Poland Uprising and Silesian Uprisings broke out. Soon after, the Polish-Bolshevik War began. The young Republic of Poland had to defend its independence, in 1919, the Blue Army under the command of General Haller went to Poland where it fought to defend an independent Poland against its enemies, which included the Bolshevik Red Army, which intended to invade Poland and spread communism throughout Europe. In September 1919, Marshal Józef Piłsudski issued an order to incorporate all emigrant armed forces into the structure of the Polish Army. General Haller was removed as the commander of the Blue Army in June 1919 and directed to the Polish-German border to take command of the Southwest Front. The Blue Army was disbanded entirely. Individual formations became part of other national military units. Under a different, constantly changing command, soldiers of the Blue Army, colloquially known as Hallerczycy after the general, felt abandoned and disappointed. Volunteers from the United States were demobilized, angered the Polish-American community and the volunteers themselves, the soldiers. The matter was discussed at the highest levels of the American authorities. The issue of returning the demobilized volunteers was raised in the House of Representatives at the beginning of 1920. The House authorized Secretary of War Newton Baker to transport them on American cargo vessels ships tasked with supplying American troops stationed in the occupied Rhineland. Apart from recognition and awarding them the cross of Polish soldiers from America, the veterans were left to fend for themselves. In general, it may be said that the Polish troops coming from overseas are an unusually fine lot of men and will make excellent soldiers and splendid American citizens if properly directed. Isn't that beautiful? So it's signed by H.C. Hale, Brigadier General, General, U.S. Army, Commander of Fort Dix, and it was sent to his commanding officer, the General at Headquarters, Eastern Department on Governor's Island, New York. What year? 20, July of 1920. That's when most of them came back in 
1920. I invite you to meet Mrs. Henrietta Nowakowski, whose father, Ignacy Zapetowski, was a soldier of the Polish army in France. Mrs. Henrietta, before we talk about your project involving Haller's army soldiers resting in Sepulchre Cemetery, please remind us of the sad story of the return of the soldiers to the Polish army, to the United States, to their families, and to their homes in America. I'd like to start with their demobilization. The war is, is finished to a point in 1920. The um, soldiers mostly came back in the, in the summer of 1920, some in 1921, and one of those buried in the cemetery that you mentioned came back in 1922. So it was a, it was a continuous uh, return. Some of the veterans remained in Poland, uh, and incidentally, if it were not for the depression, the crack, the, the crash of the Wall Street market, I probably wouldn't be here today because my parents were, their ambition was to return to Poland, but because they lost all of their savings in the banks that crashed, uh, I am here and not in Poland. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Do you have uh, any idea do you, uh, how many uh, volunteers Came from back? Michigan, yes. Oh, from when, Michigan, no. Yes. But I know there were at least 10 or more thousand that came back. I know a portion of them came uh, stayed in Poland. As I mentioned earlier, my parents were planning to go back because the Polish government gave them a piece of land, mostly in the eastern part of Poland. and of the newly formed Poland. And um, some of them actually uh, had their same, uh, same Polish Army Veterans Association that formed here was also formed in Poland. So they were um, those that stayed behind. What year your father came back here? He came in 1907. My father came a long time before this started, and of course he signed up in the Polish Falcons immediately and trained and was one of the first. He was number 17 in the application to join the Army in October of 1917. How did the idea for the project, which I call Mrs. Henrietta Nabakowski's project, come about? Let's recall that the project concerned the unnamed graves of Blue Army veterans buried at the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in South Hill on plot number five. Well, we'd have to go back to my childhood. <laughs> I remember going to the cemetery where there were um, uh, ceremonies honoring these men. There was, I remember one of the mentions is uh, Hurlutnia. I don't know if you remember that choir. Yes, I The Lutnia choir sang, and there were uh, uh, wreaths placed, uh, placed at the graves and so forth. I remember that from my childhood. And um, I was always curious about some of the unanswered questions about this whole project, and, and I had the good fortune to interview two people who were connected with the organization that funded these graves. And um, it was a Mr. Galas, who was Michał Galas, who was a widower whose wife was um, president probably 15, 20 years of this organization of women that we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. And of Mrs. Julia Pella, who was the widow of a man who was one of those returning veterans and who was actually gassed, uh, it was mustard gas that was used in World War I, chemical warfare, and um, many of the men returning had problem with their lungs. I interviewed Mr. Galas in uh, October of 1981. He died a month later, so that was fortunate, and then Mrs. Pella a few months later in January of 1982, and so I got a lot of information from them about how this organization started. Um, in addition to that, my mother was secretary of that organization, the Polish Women's Auxiliary Number no. 5. That was their official title. They were established to help the returning veterans to aid them in any way they can. And it was their idea 
to purchase 72 cemetery lots. In 1929, the Polish Ladies Auxiliary Corps No. 5 purchased 72 grave sites at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery for Polish Army veterans returning from battlefields in France and Poland. Approximately 30 years later, 12 grave sites were turned over to the Polish Legion of American Veterans Ladies Auxiliary, Chapter 12. Of the 59 buried there, two of which were veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces, 37 had no markers. The graves of these World War I soldiers were not identifiable until December 2022. Thanks to the generosity of Poland's Institute of National Remembrance, 60 grave monuments have been installed. Who was the originator? of the purchase of cemetery plots for the grace of those volunteers from Michigan. A group of Polish women in Detroit who were established for the basic reason of helping these men who were injured, who were, had no family, who had no jobs. Many of them came back and had no jobs waiting for them. They left and came back to nothing really. And so it was a very charitable and um, very humane thing for these women to do. Because my mother was secretary for years and years and years, and she had the good sense not to give up this one book from the period of the 1930s. Uh, I read there that they would uh, give them baskets of food because they were in fact, one entry shows where they went to Wanda Park, where their veterans' home was, and they had no food and did things like that. They helped, they helped some children of these veterans who needed clothing for school or books for school. They did a lot of charitable work, and the cemetery is one of the more significant projects, I think we could say. But the veterans, they used to live in uh, Park Wanda? Just men who had no home and needed some kind of a place to, to stay. Okay. That's, that was the whole purpose of the building uh, of Wanda Park in general. I know it costs you a lot of effort, time, research, and knocking from door to door to get someone interested in your project. Of the 59 graves, as many as 37 had no information about Haller's soldiers. How did you get information about them? I'd have to go back to 2007, which took me back to Holy Sepulchre Cemetery for the first time since my childhood. And that came about because the Polish Genealogical Society of Michigan was um, had a series of articles on cemeteries, mostly connected with Polish churches, not only, and they had an article about Mount Olivet Cemetery, which mm -hmm. has a section of Polish soldiers buried there. And I told them about Holy Sepulcher, because I remembered that there were Hallerczycy, or members of Haller's army buried there. And so I took them there and they wrote an article and luckily at that time I got a list of who was buried there mm -hmm. and the list changed a little because one of them was exhumed and that's how I know who was in that grave that's now empty and in what he, he was there in 2007 but in 2017 10 years later he was gone and exhumed and buried somewhere else so I know that that's the period when he exactly was taken out of the cemetery. His name was Ludwig Bogatsky, if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. But um, so, so the list was accurate, and all the cemetery had was the name and often misspelled, which was a very difficult project because the exact spelling was, if you don't have the exact spelling, it's kind of hard to find. But eventually it was corrected.
the cemetery only had their name, their date of burial, not the date of death, not the date of birth, just those two pieces of information, name and date of burial. And so uh, the EPN, or the Institute of National Remembrance, EPN as it's called in Polish, Instytut Pamięci Narodowej, sent a list after I gave them the list of the names. They did all the research they could in, in Poland. But you have to remember that the war destroyed a lot of their records. And so they were very, very incomplete. Mm -hmm. The um, places that I went to, well, first of all, I tried m many, to get many people interested in promoting this project. Uh, the Polish Legion of American Veterans, who were the final owners or managers of those graves. I went to the Polish Army Veterans Association here in Detroit. They were not able to help. I went to uh, several other individuals and finally went to Father Krull at Orchard Lake and he directed me to the, to the then director of the Polish mission, as it was called then, Arkadiusz Gurecki. And thanks to him, the project really took off. He is the one who um, made the connection with Orchard Lake, between Orchard Lake and the Institute of National mm -hmm. Remembrance, or EPN in Poland. And that started the ball rolling because they were very enthusiastic about honoring finally these men. And when I went there in 2007, I saw the, the lack of identification, the lack of any kind of care it was a very sad sight, and that's really what started it in 2007. And then in 2017, it finally got going. And um, thanks to those two men, it got started. It means that uh, any other organization was not interested in the topic? Well, they were, well, the Polish Legion of American Veterans didn't even know what I was talking about. They had no idea they were even in charge of that. Are all the puzzles about uh, the buried soldiers did you manage to solve? Until the 1960s, the last, the last one was buried in 1962. And I think after that time, the, the main um, proponents of the cemetery, that's Mrs. Galas, who was the president, mm -hmm. she died in 1970 something, turned turned uh, the whole matter over to these ladies in, in uh, the Polish Legion of American Veterans. And apparently they just, after all those original ladies died, no one else cared about it. And that's a little sad. I think part of the reason might be, if you're a serviceman in the United States Army or Navy or whatever branch of service, you, you, if you request it, you get a, a plot a cemetery plot, mm -hmm. a, a grave site, and you get a marker telling you what army you served in, what division you were in. If, if you wish to have that, the government will give you that. And perhaps these ladies figured that, um, well, this really is not a necessary thing for us because the, po the, United, the United States government will take care of these men. So, Maybe that's the reason that it fell into, I think apathy would be a good word. They just didn't feel a need for it anymore. So going back to, to your question about the research that, that was yes. required for this project. So this is a list of what Poland's is from EPN. Let's call it EPN because it's so much simpler. That, mm -hmm. that very fine group in Poland, which is government sponsored, that took over this project. So you see all the blank spaces there? And this is the same, and all that had to be filled in. And that repeats on every page. So there was an awful lot that had to be done. It's about and, 59 and I went, soldiers? I'm sorry? How many soldiers do you have? Well, 59. 59, okay. 59, which is the current list today. Mm -hmm. There were 60 in 2007, now they're at 59. It was a lot of work. Okay, so where who, did I who stop? Who did this work? I did with a lot of help. I appealed to the, um, first of all, there's a list, the, f the Federation of East European Family History Societies, F-E-E-F-H-S. 
they had a list among their, on their website of all the names of applicants to the Polish army and they gleaned that list from the Polish Museum of America in Chicago, which has a pretty uh, extensive list. O projekcie y, dowiedziałam się pewnego razu będąc w konsulacie i tam zobaczyłam panią Henriety. Kiedy dowiedziałam się, że ona jest jakby głową tego projektu, bo pewnie tak można nazwać, ogromnie się ucieszyłam i wiedziałam, że ten projekt wcześniej czy później dojdzie do końca. Sam projekt pojawił się u nas poprzez prośbę oficjalną z Orchard Lake, aby wspomóc i poszukiwać skanów dokumentów rekrutacyjnych do Armii Polskiej. Oczywiście pojawiło się tam nazwisko pani Henriety i oczywiście z wielką radością przystąpiliśmy do projektu, ale dobrze go pamiętamy, ponieważ był to czas pandemii. To był, zdaje się, marzec 2020 rok, kiedy nasze muzeum było zamknięte i wszyscy pracowaliśmy z domu. Ale oczywiście projekt interesujący. Obie archiwistki, Teresa Sromek i ja, miałyśmy przyjemność uczestniczenia przez, no, powiedzmy, wiele tygodni. To była setka bodaj nazwisk do sprawdzenia, bo trzeba pamiętać, że yy, o tym samym nazwisku było wiele akt z różnych miejscowości, z różnych centrów rekrutacyjnych, czyli znalezienie nazwiska i imienia wcale nie oznaczało, że to jest weteran, którego pani Henrietta Bo, poszukuje. Rozumiem, że pani Henrietta podała państwu nazwiska, tak? I... Tak, otrzymaliśmy nazwiska i bardzo szybko odkryłyśmy wspólnie z Teresą, że te nazwiska się powtarzają. I przykładowo, gdyby pani Henrietta poprosiła nas, to wówczas mamy Jan Dworecki z punktu rekrutacyjnego numer 3 w Detroit, Michigan. Przykładowo ta osoba to jest ta osoba, której poszukuje mm -hmm. pani Henrietta, ale mamy też to samo nazwisko z Erie, Pensylwania. Czyli prawdopodobnie to był całkiem ktoś inny. Całkiem tak? ktoś inny, oczywiście. Tutaj mamy John, czyli już zmienione imię, ale też Erie, Pensylwania. Tutaj mamy takie same nazwisko Dworecki z Buffalo, New York. I gdybyśmy tak szukali, tutaj daję jeden z przykładów, e, tych osób byłoby więcej i więcej. Czyli ten problem y, mieliście, czy miała pani przy każdym nazwisku? Czy ja nie miałam powiedział? problemu. Ja sądzę, że problem to miała pani, pani Henrietta. Henrietta. I tu chcę docenić, bo ona dokonała wyboru, który to, który to jest Jan który jest, jest właściwym tak. Janem, którego ona poszukiwała. My przygotowaliśmy setki skanów spośród których ona na podstawie swoich badań wybrała tych konkretnych. Sądzę, że z naszej kolekcji zostało wybrane około 30 weteranów. Te akta rekrutacyjne są częścią naszego zespołu. Ten zespół nazywa się Wydział Narodowy Polski i to jest organizacja, która powstała w Chicago w 1916 roku i operowała do 1926 roku. Te akta były złożone w naszym budynku i w momencie, kiedy powstało Archiwum i Muzeum Zjednoczenia Polskiego Rzymskokatolickiego w 1934 roku, Mieczysław Hajman, pierwszy kustosz, Muzeum już wówczas zaczął te akta opracowywać. Trwało to długie lata, ponieważ to jest 35 metrów y, akt y, i przed tysiąc, y, 2000, 2018 rokiem, kiedy przygotowywaliśmy wystawę Polonia rusza do boju, te akta posłużyły jako jak gdyby oryginalne świadectwo y, tamtych czasów i były pokazane w ogromnej ilości na przepięknej wystawie. Wśród tych akt właśnie są akta rekrutacyjne do Armii Polskiej. To są tysiące młodych ludzi, który, którzy od 6 października 1917 roku wstępowali do Armii Polskiej w różnych punktach rekrutacyjnych, także w Detroit. Chciałabym zwrócić uwagę, że te akta rekrutacyjne składały się z trzech części. Formularz A, Formularz B tak? i formularz C. Ale to wszystko nie są karty zgłoszenia? Czy, czy... Pierwsza karta, formularz A, to jest karta zgłoszenia bardzo ogólne mhm. wiadomości. 
Formularz B jest egzaminem medycznym, czyli miał przy tym, przy tym udział lekarz, który badał. Natomiast według mnie najciekawszy jest formularz C. Czyli powołań, że już jest zaakceptowany do Armii Polskiej we Francji. Nawet nie o to chodzi, ale jest tutaj data urodzenia i sądzę, okay. że te formularze posłużyły pani Henriecie najbardziej do wytypowania właściwych osób. Są też najbliżsi krewni, którzy mieszkają w pobliżu są też tutaj przesłany ze stacji rekrutacyjnej. Czasami stacje rekrutacyjne przesyłały weteranów z jednego miejsca na drugi. Różne były tego powodu. Było 47 punktów rekrutacyjnych i tylko oficerowie rekrutacyjni wiedzieli, jak należy tymi, tymi ochotnikami dyrygować. Czasami zdarza się taka notatka. Przyrzekam być gotowym do wyjazdu dnia i tutaj akurat mamy 9 stycznia 1918 roku. Są też zatwierdzone podpisy i jest też podpis yy, yy, ochotnika. ochotnika. Nie zawsze, nie wszyscy byli piśmienni. I also appealed to uh, Dr. Lachowicz in New York City, who has a list of only those who actually signed up to the Polish Veterans Organization upon their return. If they did not sign up, he had no information about them. And I also appealed to um, Mrs. Valerie Koselka, who is the president of the Polish Legion of the Polish Genealogical Society in Michigan. Mm -hmm. She was a big help. Um, I appealed to my neighbor, Debbie Siegel, who is a, a, a subscriber to Ancestry.com. She looked up some things for me. So between all of them. And so, so the rest, um, I would go to funeral homes. I would go to the newspapers, look for articles. I would go to uh, funeral homes, wherever I possibly could to get at least an inkling of information to, to fill out the most important things, of course, which was date of birth and date of death. And if they were actually an authentic member of the Polish army. And you satisfied with the Well, it's interesting because every, every time I look over, and this is just a, a very small, example of my materials. I probably have three more boxes of material and they were all, all sorts of uh, sources of information. Um, every time I go through them I find something new. The dedication of the soldiers' graves took place in May 1929. What those celebrations were like? This is the actual program. At the back is a map of how to get to Holy Sepulchre, because that was quite a distance. You know, there were no expressways there, and it was considered a part of Pontiac, interestingly enough, and now it's in Southfield, Michigan. And what you. day exactly was it? May 30th, 1929, which is actually Memorial Day, as it's called today, then was called Decoration Day. Decoration. You decorated graves mm -hmm. and uh, of veterans, mostly. Do you know who has been caring for the graves? since 1929. This Polish lady's auxiliary number five. In fact, I read in, in, uh, in the minutes book that apparently they did nothing, uh, maybe they did, but it's not in the record because I don't have the record from that period. But in 1935, I, it sounded like that was their first time to go back and have a ceremony again. Maybe until then, I don't know what they did. They could have been doing something, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, who is taking care of them today? Nobody. What? That's the sadness of this whole project. They have been totally forgotten since the 60s, at least since 62 when the last one was buried. There, there's been nothing going on, and, and that's the sad part, and that's what what motivated me to do something finally because it's these men gave so much of their life they you know they risked their lives and when they didn't have to when's the last time you knew of of young men going to Canada I know that when they were trying to avoid the uh, Vietnam War they went there to avoid the draft and not to sign up so so um, you know they, they they deserve to be recognized and to be honored and not forgotten Your project has been completed. In December 2022, new gravestones with crosses and names were installed.
Some of those nameless stamps now have their names, birth date and death. And all this is a gift from the Institute of National Remembers in Warsaw. Above the graves is a monument informing that the Polish army, veterans of the Blue Army, 1917-1920, rest in this spot. But have you seen it? Yes, I have. It was very thrilling and very emotional, actually, to see after uh, 15 years of thinking about this that it's finally become reality. Yeah, it's, it and was a very satisfying feeling and a very emotional after feeling. After five years? Well, five, 15, you actually. Said it. Yes. Yeah, 15 years, really, when you start. 2007 is when I got the first list, and that's when it start, the wheels started turning as to the sadness of what I saw when I went there for the first time since my childhood. That's when it really started. So I'm happy. I'm very happy. Ale pięknie wygląda. Właśnie to jest ta pierwsza czwórka. Gancarz, Taraszkiewicz, Gołuba i Dworecki. To ci pierwsi byli pochowani w 1929 roku. Tego Gancarza to trzy, cztery różne wersje jego nazwiska. Musiałam o tak. Gancarz to jest właściwe. To, to wyszukałam, żeby było akurat dokładnie tak, jak powinno być. To widocznie ta jest, to jest ta pierwsza część, to jest 29, 33. To widocznie ta pierwsza, ta pierwsza część. I to wszystko 30, 31. To, to były te pierwsze groby. What do you think your father would say today? a veteran of the Polish army fighting for the Poland's independence. Oh, my father would be so happy. Uh, uh, his whole life was Placówka Siódma. He was one of the organizers. He was the original treasurer on Dukasierem. Uh, he was one of the men that organized Placówka Siódma. And that was in 1921, a year after they came back. And he would be thrilled. He would be thrilled, he would be very happy, and that makes me happy. Some people think I'm doing this for my father because he's buried there. I'm really doing it for my father. He is not buried there, he's buried in Mount Olivet. Why are you doing it for all of the soldiers? Uh, well, yes, but, but it's because um, my parents brought me up the way they did, and that's why I'm doing it, I guess, I don't know. I, uh, our whole life, our whole family life was wrapped around the two organizations that were very involved in, in this whole volunteer army. It was the Polish Falcons, who were the masterminds, actually, of this whole um, volunteer army. They were the instructors at various um, training camps and so forth. And the Polish Army veterans who were formed in 1921, as I said, my father was one of the organizers of the first uh, post in Detroit. Uh, their friends, their lives were wrapped around those two organizations, and so I grew up in that environment. And so it would be natural that I would feel an obligation to do this. My grandfather and, of course, my own, my own father, World War II, World War I, the, the conflicts in, in France and Poland leading up you know, in the in between time there, but uh, service to country is so. It seems on a present day, it's not as much on the mind of young people, and I think it's critical that these things are are taught. We take the time to learn and find out about it, and it's preserved and passed on from generation to generation because it's truly a treasure. Pani Henrietto, thank you very much for all the effort you put into bring the project to the end. Congratulations, Pani Henrietta. We are so grateful for what you have done for them, the Polish soldiers and our Polish community in Michigan, and not only in Michigan. Well, you're welcome, and it's a very, very satisfied feeling. It feels that um, life was worth living to get to this point. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I feel very, very happy about the whole thing. I, I, Glad that it happened. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
perhaps they might agree that this empty grave could represent all of those volunteer soldiers who died in battle and who rest in cemeteries in France and Poland. Ci ludzie, którzy wyjeżdżali do Stanów Zjednoczonych, do Kanady, do Brazylii, do innych krajów, często samowolnie, ale zazwyczaj przymusowo, bo tak do tego zmuszała ich czy polityka, czy warunki życiowe, oszukali po prostu lepszych możliwości rozwoju, często potem wracali właśnie w mundurze, jako żołnierze, jako ci, którzy mimo, że już na przykład spędzili ileś lat na uchodźstwie, to pamiętali o Polsce i kiedy nadarzyła się okazja walki o niepodległość, raz jeszcze, to nie mieli żadnych wątpliwości, że należy ten mundur założyć, należy zawiesić na ramieniu broń i ruszyć z powrotem do Polski. I myślę, że gdybyśmy dzisiaj zapomnieli o ich grobach, gdybyśmy o nie nie dbali tak, jak powinniśmy dbać, no to myślę, że że popełniliśmy, popełnilibyśmy naprawdę niewybaczalny grzech. Także powiem Pani osobistą historię. Wiele lat temu po raz pierwszy miałem okazję pojechać i zobaczyć cmentarz na Monte Cassino polskich żołnierzy, którzy w tamtej bitwie polegli. Razem z dwójką moich dzieci, małych wtedy jeszcze. I muszę Pani powiedzieć, że Pierwszy raz widziałem moje dzieci płaczące rzewnymi łzami na cmentarzu, mimo że tam nie mamy żadnych swoich przodków, członków rodziny pochowanych na Monte Cassino, ale to nawet dla takich młodych ludzi, młodych Polaków, to było no, niezwykłe i myślę, że niezapomniane doświadczenie. Kiedy człowiek sobie uświadomi właśnie jakiego, jakiego czynu, jaki, jaką ofiarę złożyli polscy żołnierze, czy to pod Monte Cassino, czy w, w Narwiku, czy w Falez, czy w wielu, wielu, wielu innych miejscach, w których walczyli, czy to podczas II wojny światowej, czy tak jak Halerczycy w czasach, kiedy odzyskiwaliśmy niepodległość w 1918 roku. Cios uderza pierś narodu co za wolność ginąć zwykł Barbarzyńskie hordy wschodu Niosą topór, knut i stryk Pod nogami nędznej dziczy Wolna ziemia pluska krwią I od czerni na jezdniczej Czmi pluśnierstwo z depczem ją Jarny orle biały, zbawić ludy jeszcze raz. Marsz Polaków pole chwały, dzień triumfu wzywa nas. Polska bitwo pieśni czynu, niech grzmi w niebo pacierz Twój. Nie za marny liść Wawrzynu, za ojczyznę idziem w bój. Nad odwieczny dach piastowy, nad rozłogi chlebnych chór. Lecz nasz hymnie narodowy, szczęku szabel świście kur. Wstań ofiarny orle biały, zbawić ludy jeszcze Polskie słońce jak źrenica Patrzy w tęczę polskich snów Pieśń zwycięstwa gra stolica